Now, Sarah, we're especially lucky to have you here, hot on the heels of your absolutely triumphant success, the Sixth Commandment. And as many of you will know, it was described in The Guardian by Lucy Mangan as immaculate a piece of TV as you will see. I agree, I think it should win every award going, but it's, an inc it's a really hard story yeah. about a, a vile murderer, Ben Field, who uh, befriended and pretended to be in love with a very elderly man, um, Peter Farquhar, and um, a woman, Anne Moore Martin. And I, I just wanted to ask you, first of all, what that was like to have to get into the mind of a murderer like that, but also to, to, to feel the, the, the distress and fear of his victims. Okay, that's a really big question. Um, I think one of the things when I first got involved with this uh, project, um, and Brian Woods, the executive producer of True Vision, had <coughs> was one of the execs on this, and Brian and his colleagues had made a documentary called for the Channel 4 series Catching a Killer, and this documentary was called Diary from the Grave, and it was about Thames Valley Police's major crime department investigating this. It was a two-year investigation into Benfield, and Brian had made this incredible documentary. And um, so I, I'd watched that, and when I watched that and started to look at some of the preliminary research, and it's interesting, this whole thing about getting into the mind of a killer, because what I, I knew what I didn't want to do from the very, very start was I didn't want to do what I think some true crime is, is guilty of, and a lot of fictionalised crime is very guilty of, which is glamorising the killer. We, we've got a rather um, habit in this country that when we're sort of, in lots of uh, fictionalised crime, like The Fall or Messiah or the most recent Netflix um, show about Jeffrey Dahmer, everything is seen from the killer's point of view. And even if you're showing what they're doing that is, is to be absolutely remorselessly horrible, there is nonetheless a glamour that is given to them from, from the mm. camera because we're spending time with them and we're we are seeing the world through that person's eyes. And I knew that I absolutely didn't want to do that with Ben Field and that I wanted to tell the stories of Peter and Anne and their families. And because beyond what Ben did, it's the rupture that it did to those people. It's the absolute demolition and destruction, the scorched earth that he visited on those people and on those families. And incidentally, Peter and Anne were not alone as victims of Ben. There were others, there were many other people, um, but Peter and Anne were who we focused on. And the extraordinary thing is, and what really helped me with that, was that Peter Farker was a, a meticulous diarist. And he wrote diaries in which he noted down even, you know, whether or not he'd had one too many cups of coffee or how much that cup of coffee cost him and whether it should have cost him that much. And it was very, you know, really a sort of like, a sort of diligent noting of absolutely everything, whether it was completely banal or whether it was absolutely heartbreaking, which was his desperate loneliness and his longing to be loved, his yearning yearning for love and how conflicted he was, how disgusted and he was by his conflict that he felt that he was betraying Christ in some way and that the church would never welcome him. So you had these, you know, the, the whole of human life from I had a macaroni cheese to actually I am throwing myself at God's mercy. Is he going to be, is he, if it, it's up to him. You know, I just open my heart to God. Will God, will God save me from my loneliness? It's like this huge expanse. And so we had these. And of course, that meant that when Peter met Ben and Ben started to sidle his way into his life, that Peter was overjoyed and wrote down his joy, no, wrote about it with such passion and delight but then he also started to write about being ill and how no, 
nobody could really understand what was going on with him and all the consultants that he was seeing and <coughs> how he had to spend the day in bed and how Ben brought him a cup of tea. What would I do without him taking such good care of me? I love him so much. And when you read these things, it's devastating to read. And I had a huge amount of research material, all of the diaries, a two-year police investigation, which was multi-agency and with, you know, toxicology, pharmacology, sort of, you know, di forensic digital um, <clears throat> investigations. It was, you know, a huge amount. I mean, it, I have it locked up in a massive chest just to sort of keep it in control. And... And you could find yourself spinning out in a little way and you could almost find yourself thinking, well, maybe that's a story, maybe that's a story. But what really helped me keep in mind what the story was, was Peter's diaries and meeting and interviewing and spending time with Peter's family and Anne Moore Martin's family and her niece, who had basically said, this is not right, something is happening, I want something done. And she triggered the police investigation. So it was always about centering that story, even when what I was reading was so horrible that it genuinely gave me nightmares, even then it was about bringing it back every time and earthing it in what was really, really important. And that was the love and courage of those families to stay on their feet and see this investigation and this court case through. And that was what, because ben, what Ben had offered all of his victims was a version of love. And he looked like the answer to their prayers. I mean, genuinely, he was the answer to Peter's prayer. To sort of to doubt Ben would have been to have doubted God, surely. And he looked like the answer to Anne's prayers with his understanding of sort of like, you know, late medieval romance poetry and, you know, metaphysical poetry and George Herbert and John Donne. And he could seduce him. He seduced the sort of church, the, the Church of England. He... He was on the way to becoming ordained. He seduced everybody, but all of it was a thin, mean, tawdry, nasty, sour version of love because all of it was about what he could get, all of it was about power. And counterbalanced with that was the love for their family members, was the love of Peter's family for him and was Anne-Marie Anne Blake's love for her aunt, which powered her through and so... It was keeping that at the forefront all the time. Because Ben, really, he's a, you know, a narcissistic psychopath. That's what he mm. is. He doesn't have some special gift of seeing the world in, in a way that us normal mortals can't. And we used to have him be in a habit of sort of casting the sort of like the serial killer <laughs> as somebody who somehow was kind of understood the world in a different way because they quoted Dante. Oh, please. So, and it was what he really is. He's a squalid, horrible, power-crazed little man. He's doing 27 years, and he'll do every day of it, I certainly hope. But I wanted to put him in his box, and I wanted to let the love and the courage and the diligence of the police officers and the, and the barristers, but that love and courage of the family, I wanted that to blaze. No, Sorry, it, that was a very long answer. Well, I, well, <laughs> Sorry. It was a great answer. And how important was it to you to highlight the role of that strong young woman who was the person who unearthed these crimes d despite uh, being undermined? I, th I think what it was... It, I mean, well, I was very aware that this was a really dark story and when you, you kind of think that there is a danger that you could be swamped by it and that, that there would be nothing at the other end for an audience and I think that if you're going to take if you're going to take an audience to some dark places they have to trust you that you're not just going there for a gratuitous reason yeah. that there is something there is something important and I think that when uh, Anne-Marie um, when Brian was making the documentary she, she hadn't wanted to be part of that documentary but she had sort of started to come round to thinking, well, maybe my, you know, my aunt's story does deserve to be heard. And obviously she was incredibly distressed and traumatised by her experience, and, but was thinking, I do want to tell her story. So and this was during sort of lockdown, or we were just sort of going in and out of the pandemic. And um, 
we, I had a very, very long phone conversation with her because she had to be certain of me, that she had to trust me mm. with her aunt's story. And I had to say, I do not want this to be prurient. I do not want this to be gratuitous. You know, this is a celebration of life, not kind of doing a spreadsheet of the victim's violations, which reduces them as people. It's about letting them live as people. So I think that when I was talking to Anne-Marie on the phone and where I was hearing, you know, that, that she'd confronted Ben, and I thought, oh, there you are, there you are with your lantern. It's almost a, an image, you know, in the darkness, there's someone with a lantern held high, illuminating and kind of holding that, no, this is where it stops. And that was the image I had for Anne-Marie and I thought, there she is with her lantern held high. She loved her aunt. She was absolutely <coughs> devoted to her. They had an incredibly close relationship, but even despite that work, children, family, you know, he still found places to mm. scuttle in. And I think that, you know, a young woman teaching, building her career, raising her children, being married, trying to get the bathroom grouted, trying to do this, trying to do that, that there's a, there's a real every woman quality to her. Mm. And then there's that blazing courage which has her go face to face with him and say, do you think you're in love with my aunt? Did you get her to change her will? Can you imagine the courage that takes to stare mm. that band down? So it was really important that that was a sort of thing that even when, when you could feel the audience going, I don't know if I can do this much longer, here she comes. And it, that was, it was really, that was really vital. The, la the lantern bearer, the light bearer, that's what you need in those kind of stories. And I noticed, because I've watched a lot of your work, that you like a woman with blazing courage. That's I like a, a woman. I like a woman with, with, a, with, a, with a, I think it's bloody mindedness, I think I like. I think I, I can't imagine why I should like that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there's a kind of and an obstinacy, and a defiance, and an, obst and an obstinacy, and, a, and but Anne Marie's courage is is, is quite exceptional. Is I, I think that she was very very brave, and I was very glad that she, well, that we had this huge conversation, and then you know, that she trusted me to tell the story. And, and obviously, when you're working very closely with um, families who have been through something like that, it's really, it's really important to make sure that nothing comes as a surprise to them and that you don't, they, they never feel like they've lost agency over this thing that happened to them, that they can trust that you're doing the right thing, not just by them, but by their experience and also by their loved one. And so Brian and I would spend a lot of time sort of like take, talking families families through e each scene, in this scene, this happens, and this character says this, and this character says this. And um, when we were doing that with Anne-Marie and talking her through all the scenes, and sometimes I'd act it out with, and th then, you know, that's why I never took to the stage, because, mm. <laughs> but, when, but we were, when I describe it, and some she'd go like, sometimes I think, like, if she says she doesn't want this to happen, I'll take it out, but I do describe a scene, she'd go, oh God, it's like you were there. And it, and it just, you know, I think that by then I was so deep into the story and deep into the people that we'd interviewed and into their lives that sometimes the characters and the writing takes over. It's almost as though you're not actively oh. thinking about it. That's a great tribute to you. And, and I have to say that when you talk about um, showing such respect for people involved in tragic stories, Hmm. I work in television hmm. as well, and that is not the norm in a very male-dominated industry. And also, something I really admired in The Sixth Commandment was that lack of um, prurient sex. And, and do you think, uh, was that connected to the fact that you're a woman? Not everything is to do with the fact that we're women, but... Well, I think this, the issue is, is that, um, I mean, if I'd have had ten, the 10 hours that Netflix routinely dishes out, I still wouldn't have been able to tell the entirety of that story. And Ben, <coughs> ben Field, um, in, in terms of how he liked to control and dominate people, um, had sex with a lot of people and had sexual relationships with a lot of people, men and women, old and young. And I just felt that 
in terms of his relationships with Peter and Anne, that it would add nothing to the story. We knew that he, uh, he and Peter shared a bed, that they were intimate but celibate because of Peter's religious, you know, Peter's religious faith. But nobody needs, I, it would only have caused distress to the family. I think it would have caused distress to the audience. It would have caused distress for me because as far as I'm concerned, what was happening in some of Ben's other relationships, he had drugged those people and if he was having a, performing sexual acts on them or with them, then as far as I'm concerned, there's no consent there and I've got no interest in mm. showing that on the TV. We know it's happened. I can hint at things and the audience can follow with their mind. We don't need to follow it there because it's, it's, I think that's at the point where people can no longer see anything but that. And there is a lot more that I need people to see about this story and about these characters. There's a lot more. I don't want things to be reduced and I don't want, thing, I don't want a whole person's life to be summed <coughs> up in a really a shocking sort of sexual crime. I, I, I think that, you know, I don't want... It's, it, feels, it would have felt prurient, gratuitous and reductive and I wanted these people to sing and not be shut up. Well, I, I have to say, I think that's most admirable and I wish that many male uh, screenwriters would take yeah, the some same of, some attitude. Of them have, some of them have, have, do have exactly the same attitude and it's, I think that one of, I mean, we have changed a lot. I mean, when I was first starting out in TV, there used to be a show on called Messiah and it was a show with Ken Stott and it was all kind of like serial killers and it was very schlocky and it was very kind of dark and oh my God, this man, ha you know, this killer has some incredible insight into the way humanity behaves. And there was a lot of sort of um, gratuitous shots of uh, brutalised female victims and things like that. And that was in the sort of about 2003, 2004, because I can remember being really furious that um, I'd been told that I couldn't say a rude word on page 10 of one of my scripts. And I was, because it fell before the watershed, and I was really livid because in Messiah there'd been a shot of, a very lingering, gratuitous shot of um, two murdered young women, sort of. And I just, well, why are we allowed to see that? Yeah. But I'm not allowed to say, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm being polite. Um, it might not stay like that. And I can remember being really angry about that, but, that, but I, I do think the culture has changed, and I do think it's changing, and I think people are much more aware of that. I think... Sometimes with something like the Dharma show, um, it, that was how it was commissioned. I don't know if it's really hit the way they <coughs> thought it might hit, mm -hmm. which would it be like a kind of cultish thing. I don't know that's happened. I think, I kind of hope that what the Sixth Commandment has done is said there's a way to tell these stories, a better way, which allows, which allows the victims to have their lives back before they were ripped away from them and the fullness of their life, the full complexity of their lives. Well, I hope so, because I think it's a very significant piece of work. Thank you. But now I would like to take you from such horror to somewhere wonderful here. <laughs> and uh, New Hall. Now, yeah. what's interesting, first of all, is your mother came sure. here. Now, many people, like my daughter sitting there, might go, well, my mother went there, so I'm definitely not going there. So how did you come to go to New Hall? Okay. Strap in. It's something of a tale. <laughs> so, um, I can remember being very little and my mum bringing me to Cambridge, and I think it was for Dame Rosemary's Memorial? No, Mrs. Clover. Mrs. Clover's Memorial. And I can remember being very little, and chiefly I mainly remember it because I was allowed to have some sherbet lemons on the train home, which is, <laughs> you know, I was that sort of girl. But I can remember being in the, in, in sort of around about the you know, in the centre of Cambridge, and sort of, it didn't really impact so much upon me, but I remember a conversation over my head, which was of somebody saying to you, and is she going to come here? And I was tiny. I don't know what was said after that, because I was way too invested in the sherbet lemons. But it was, um, I was always very, you know, when you're sort of starting to sort of like look around, read books, sort of bright had visited and books about people going to university and doing this. And I really, really loved those A.S. Byatt books, you know, the Frederica Potter books, and that just made it sound so exciting. But here's the thing. 
Unfortunately, uh, school and me didn't quite gel. And I was extremely naughty at school um, in my, you know, when I went up to comp, I was extremely naughty and caused my parents no end of grief. And I basically ended up uh, being, leaving, leaving that school at 15 and going to sort of like a crammer just to sort of keep me there so I could do my O-levels. Failing, took four O-levels, got two U's, <laughs> and, uh, and a B and a C, and all I wanted to do was get away. And I went away to um, work in Wales to get a, um, a what's called a, a horse master's certificate, which shows that you were able to push a barrow absolutely loaded down with horse crap, <laughs> and to really not mind being paid anything more than seven pound fifty a week, which I duly achieved. But I, we, we'd always gone on to Wales on holiday, and um, and I loved it there. And I was also totally in love with Under Milkwood, and I really, we'd always had a brilliant time in Wales, and I just wanted to go there, and ride horses and be away from, I don't know, my town, I suppose. And I just also didn't think that university was ever going to be for me. A-levels, never going to be for me. I wasn't academic. I just couldn't stay still long enough in a room. I couldn't bear it. And when I was with the horses, well, if there were rules, those rules made sense. Don't leave that stable door open. You're right, that's a really good rule. And, so, and also, I loved being out there on the mountain, learning how to... You know, they had sheep, so they were in the February everything was lambing, and I learned how to do that, and that was amazing. And I loved, it. and I just decided, and like, I'm never going to be that person that goes to university. I'm never going to be that person that does A levels. I will work in horses, and that's what I'll do. And so for a long time, I was uh, doing that, and I was um, working as a polo groom for Ham Polo Club. I did actually once park my ponies next to Prince Charles, um, <laughs> and I'm here to tell you now that he has freckles on his back. <laughs> <laughs> Moving swiftly on. <laughs> but then, but then a, a series of things happened very close together in quick succession. And I thought, I have to do something else. I wonder what I can do. I'm quite good at patching up injured horses. Maybe I could be an equine vet nurse. But to be an equine vet nurse, I'm going to have to do an exam. Let's sign up for A-level art at night school, and let's see if I can stick that out, because if I can stick that out, and then maybe I can do ex the exams I need to be an equine vet nurse. And when I was signing up to do art at an A-level, at an evening class in the local further education college, on a whim, I signed up to do A-level English, on a whim. I'd always loved reading, and I thought, oh well, you know, my reading will be directed, I'll have, if it doesn't work out, if I can't do it, no, never mind, doesn't matter, I'll have read something. And within the first couple of minutes of the first lesson in A-level English, I realised what it, I realised what I'd been missing and that my life was never going to go back, that I was never going to be an equine vet nurse and that I'd found something and it was like water in the desert. And so I did that and got my you know, did the reading and I loved it so much and the art and I loved it and I loved that whole thing of college life. And at the same time, my brother Matt was going off to Aberystwyth to study fine art and I kept looking at him and thinking, God, that looks fun. That looks like fun. And then wondering what I could do next. And I went to a college called Hillcroft, which was for adult women returning to education. And it's been established by the WEA and um, it was just a tiny college and I was one of, you know, the, the there was a huge, wide diversity of women there. I think the oldest lady there was sort of 68, and she, after a year there, she went off to go and do her first degree in fine art. I can't remember where she went. And lots of people were sort of coming out of motherhood, and their children had grown up, and they were going back to sort of like do degrees in sociology or sort of train to go and be social workers or nurses or to do history degrees. It was fascinating. It was brilliant. And I loved that, did a modular course, English, drama, economics, architecture. And then I started to think, what do I want to do next? And for the sheer chutzpah of it, because I thought, if I'm going to try and go anywhere, 
I have to try, I'm going to try and go to Cambridge, and if I'm going to go to Cambridge, I'm going to try my mum's college. Because there was this feeling that, you know, that when you read the novels and everything, everything, oh, well, my father went there. Oh, my father went there. Yes, my father was a Trinity man. <laughs> Grandfather was too. And I thought, if that's the case, well, I'm going to go, I'm going to go the, the, the mum route. My mum went to Newhall, I'm going to apply to Newhall. And so I applied to Newhall. I must have written a really good begging letter. I came and sat. I didn't, obviously, I didn't have the matriculation requirements in no way. And I came and sat a really, uh, the college, Hillcroft were obviously, wrote, were really helpful with writing, you know, a reference. And I came and sat a three hour exam where apparently I answered all the wrong questions. <laughs> <laughs> but I got an offer and I was astonishing to me. It was astonishing to me. And it never stops being astonishing. And I'm, I can't be alone in the room where there's a certain smell round about late September, early October, where you go, oh, beginning of the new term, OK. And it's just, it, it's a real pull on the heart. And it's a little kind of like flutter in the blood where you just, it's a smell of riding down to the, you know, to Sidgwick or along the backs or something like that. It's autumn now and it's nice, but in a minute it's going to get really cold and there's no cold like Cambridge. <laughs> there really isn't. And you go like, oh, yeah, yeah, God, that really gets deep into your bones. So, yeah, I came here and, and it was amazing. And the college itself, how did that help and support you and nurture and encourage you, do well, you think? Well, I, th I think when I arrived, I mean, like, I'd come with all the braggadocio of the fully un uninformed. And, you know, like, fully giving it lots of swagger. And then suddenly I had this crash and I thought, I don't have a clue what I'm doing. I really don't. I haven't... I don't know how to write an essay. I have made a terrible, terrible, terrible mistake. And I went and saw my director of study, who was um, director of study, Dr Kate Pretty. And... Um, and I was sort of bleating and moaning. She was fascinating. She kept this artefact on her... On her desk because she was archaeology and anthropology and anytime you just got a little bit sort of self-involved or, or bored her which was frankly often and she'd say and she'd pick up this artifact and go what do you think this is and you'd look at it and you'd go, it was like a shape like a spearhead and you'd go my god I don't know is it onyx or is it this and she's like it's a marmite jar <laughs> and it had been found and fashioned and somebody had fashioned to use it as a blade and it was a bit, it was a bit of old Marmite glass or Vegemite glass rather because it, it had come from Australia. And I'd said to her, look, I, thanks and all, but I'm fe I, am, I don't know what I'm doing and I think I've made a mistake. And she just sort of gave me this really glaucous look over her spectacles and says, nobody knows what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody knows what you're doing. You haven't made a mistake. You're not here as an act of charity. We're not charitable. I'm not charitable. <laughs> and, and it was basically an absolutely no quarter given. I was like, I thought I was going to get some sympathy. And it's just like, <laughs> no. And, just say, and the thing that she said, which really stuck with me, she said, we don't want a homogenous student body. We don't want everybody to be the same. Otherwise, we're going to be constantly teaching the same lesson over and over and over again. Are we a dripping tap? I'm, we're not. She didn't actually say that bit about the dripping tap, but she did talk a lot about this is what it means to be at this college, which is not a homogenous student body. We the student body needs people who come with a different background because you're going to read things differently and respond differently. And I kind of did walk out of there thinking, OK, I've been really self-indulgent. And I mean, I won't say that I found the first year, and I found it really difficult learning to write essays and learning to read differently. But I think everybody found that the same. Everybody, you, everybody comes in with swagger from their sixth form. They're the most brilliant kid in their sixth form. And suddenly they're at Cambridge and, or any university, and they're not the most brilliant kid anymore. It's a massive cultural adjustment. But uh, the thing that I never got over, sorry, Dorothy, I'm just blathering, but the thing that I never got over, and it amazed me, and I had this, um, I, had the, I, I was doing, um, doing some Dante, because I really loved him, and we were doing the Vita Nuova, and there's this really amazing 
worked with this really amazing supervisor called Dr. Robin Kirkpatrick at Robinson's, and his room was chaos. It was, I have no idea how all those, it was just sort of tottering piles of books and papers and pictures and this, and he'd be sat in the middle, this lovely man, generally with sort of like a, a sherry tray laid out, which was, you know, and he, he'd go in there and we'd start to talk about, you know, the Vita Nuova, and he'd say, what do you think? And you go, this is your life's work, your absolute life's work, and you're asking all these callow, idiotic children, what do you think, with genuine interest? And I kept thinking, this is the most, what an astonishing thing, what an astonishing gift and a privilege that you walk into a room and somebody who knows this stuff backwards, knows Chaucer and Shakespeare and Gawain in the Green Knight and Flannery O'Connor and Aeschylus backwards. And they say, what do you think? It's amazing, it's amazing. I never, I never got over that, the sort of charge of being asked. And then actually found, finding that I did actually think something. I did actually think something about, you know, all of this. That was the surprise. It never stopped being a surprise. It never stopped being a delight. It felt like being, three years I felt like I was high. It was amazing. <laughs> and in what way did you think it was different and good or bad that this is a this was a women's college did that make a difference well interestingly enough the thing was and i'm sure this has changed now but when um when i was came in 1989 there would be quite a lot of girls who had really wanted to go to sort of john's or trinity and 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 had sort of ended up in newhall by the by the pool and were sort of like quite kind of but i wanted to meet boys we're still going to meet boys I mean like you know come on but I think that's changed but you could see you could see that changing a little bit and I did think I mean I'm sure it's as the culture has changed a lot but when I would be in mixed supervision sometimes with um people from Trinity or Kings and sort of so a lot of the time guys from Trinity and Kings Christ almighty they made a lot of noise they talked a lot and I can remember one guy from Trinity banging on and on and on about the sort of like you know the, the, the uh, uh, Prince Hal's probity in Henry the fourth one and two and there's finally the supervisor and the, the saying very gently I don't think probity means what you think it means <laughs> and watching this guy go <laughs> but I also thinking that people that sometimes you'd go and people would be very surprised when you were as vocal as you were as a female undergraduate in a in, in a mixed super in a, you know in a in a big seminar that, that you would be as vocal as you were like and I'm sure it's changed I, since then but at that time I think I was really glad to be somewhere where I wasn't kind of acting acting out and kind of drinking too much and going to too many parties and trying to fit in that way that there was actually a kind of you can have all that and then you can come back up the hill and you can go to your room and you can be with your friends and you can concentrate on being clever. <laughs> Which I think was a, one of the things that was really important. You can concentrate on being funny and weird and brilliant and strange and odd and eccentric and clever. You can go down the town and you can mingle with all the riffraff from the other colleges. <laughs> You can laugh at their blazers or whatever. I'm being cruel. But because I had loads of friends from Johnson Trinity and places like that. But then you come back up. And there was, rather than feeling like, oh, we're back up the hill and back up in Newhall, it's like uh, there was a sort of sense that actually the, you went down and then you left and you went back up to this sort of magical place. And everybody was queer, where, where generally, I think that with Newhall women kind of, there was a vibe. In this, there was a vibe in the rest of the university because they were outspoken and they said things and they didn't, they, were, they just didn't quite fit the model of lots of other girls. Well, in fact, our young students today say very similar things to that. They talk about when they go to supervisions, men speaking over them. Oh, yeah, and, well, and, you know, yeah. And, and how uh, much they appreciate having some time here especially in their first year doing supervisions yeah. with other women you, and you, having here as a, 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 a place to come back to. You have to sort of feel your way and sort of like find your 
your voice, as it were, and learn how to sort of make an opinion, but also how to listen to other people. And I think that just having that, that space to not have to worry about there's a there's a there's a you know you've got to think well, that boy is talking so I must be quiet and it's just a, you know because you're then you're not listening you're sort of thinking when is my chance to jump in and I do think it's I do think it was important you know you don't have to worry about this you're just concentrating on being on, on finding out who you are not finding out who they are finding out who you are with all the other sort of girls in the room as it were I my, my some of my best the people I met pretty much my first week uh, Sue Perkins and Nicola Walker are still my best friends today and they've still got that where they still got that thing which is knowing who you are I think and learning who you are during these three years without that learning who you are being compromised by having to fit in around other you know lots of other crushing sort of sexual dynamics and gender dynamics and when you were finding out who you were during those three years, were you beginning to think, I could be a writer? Were you beginning no. to write then? So how did the writing well, uh, well, and the uh, confidence to I, do that begin? Oh, well, here, well, so I really wanted to be... Um, I really thought I'd be an amazing actor. I thought I'd be... <laughs> I thought I was what the stage and screen was waiting for. It's just like, <laughs> who is that? She's one of the finest talents in the home counties. Oh, that? Oh, it's... But I was in a show, um, and we'd been in Edinburgh, and it came down and did a couple of nights in Battersea Arts Centre. And my family came along, and my brothers came along, and just before my entrance, and when I walked out, all I could see was my brothers doubled over, crying with laughter. I was like, what were you laughing at? They said, we knew you were coming on stage. It sounded like a herd of heifers. I was like, oh, fuck it! <laughs> but I, so I really thought, I, I realised that actually, mate, you know... I wasn't, um, I wasn't as bad as most, but I wasn't as good as some. And I think that when, but when I was, when we were up in, um, we were up in Edinburgh, and we were in this show, and we were doing some dumb game, you know, like consequences, but really rude and all the rest of it, and whatever. I just gone on into a flight of fancy on one of my consequences, and our director for the show said, "You should write something. You should write." And I thought, "Oh well, okay." I will. And I'd always loved writing letters. I would meet new people and I'd write them letters that were 36 pages long. And then I'd get a postcard back going, yeah, thanks, <laughs> thanks for your letter. Um, but I always, I always loved words and I loved reading and I loved writing things, but I didn't know what to write really meant. Anyway, I wrote a play which should have been sunk, put in concrete and you know, sunk to the bottom of the North Sea. But anyway, and it went to, and it went to Manchester and um, they had a little play in uh, Manchester Royal Exchange. Um, and then I had to, you know, I left university and I had to make rent. I had to work. And I was working, so I stopped writing for a very long time and didn't write anything because I was just desperately sort of like trying to earn money, either being in tele sales or doing other terrible jobs. And then I ended up being a dresser for the Royal Shakespeare Company and running around with plastic armour and swords and strapping sort of a very angry Leslie Phillips into a costume to play Falstaff and trying to stop him from fighting other actors in the wings and all sorts of nonsense. <laughs> and then out of the blue, um, uh, a woman who'd, who I knew from here who'd worked on another show that I'd been in said, um, oh, I'm assistant director at Derby Playhouse and we're doing a a season of new works, and I wondered if you had any two-person plays. I thought, well, I don't. But I said, yeah, sure. <laughs> and out of nowhere, well, it was a three-person play, but I played the third person, so I was cheap. And um, I wrote a play about telesales people on their lunch break, because let's face it, I'd had a lot of experience of telesales people on their lunch break. And something happened with the writing and it felt like it was flexing its muscles. It felt like it was kind of rolling its muscles and its pelt was glossy, and that I had something to say, because I'd always wondered if I had anything actually real to say. And from there, you know, this little play I wrote um, went out and about, and I wrote some other things. And from there, but I got a job working on the small but mighty World Service soap opera, Westway, which meant that I could it paid no money, but it did mean that I could leave my job as a dresser 
and stop running around with plastic helmets and sort of velvet trouserines and write this little show. And then from that, I got, uh, I got invited to do a shadow scheme for EastEnders and then we were away. And it was one of those things where you just go, you look up from your desk and you go, my life is really different. It's changed so much and I haven't had the time to notice it changing. Oh God, I've got to get this finished. And it was, what, you know, it was, this, it was that, but it was, I'm, I'm always stunned when I kind of look up and go, I never expected to have this life, never. And I've got it. And you ended up doing 90 episodes of EastEnders. No, excuse me, 100 episodes of oh EastEnders. Oh, God, I keep getting everything wrong. Because my 100th episode was, uh, was the death of Peg, was I killed Peggy Mitchell, and I thought that was a perfect one to bow out on. <laughs> and had you been uh, an EastEnders fan? Did you know all the characters? And who's your favourite character Well, I was a huge e killed? I was a huge, huge, huge EastEnders fan. And uh, we'd, I'd watch it in, I had a bed sit at the time and I'd watch it and then I'd ring mum up and we'd go, oh, that Grant, what's he like, what's he doing? And um, so, yeah, I absolutely loved it. And, it, it, but it was one of those things which was, it felt like a little half hour of theatre. It's just there and you watch these people and, you know, sometimes, sometimes it's absolute nonsense, but sometimes it hits its note and it's like nothing else. Um, so yeah, I loved it, and I hit the ground running, and I thought it was a, a delight. Actually, can I tell a story? I think you're right. quite good so, at that. So, so well, I mean, like, um, I mean, like, if you uh, just quickly, my favourite character who I killed, I brought Den back from the dead. Then I killed him with Pauline Fowler's dog-shaped doorstop, and then I dug him up. <laughs> so um, <laughs> what a job for a woman. But um, I, I'd, I'd, I'd just been offered my first sort of script for um, free senders and I was, I'd, I'd just moved into my flat in Walthamstow and I was walking to the, um, the tube station and there was a woman in front of me with her friends walking very slowly because she was acting out the previous night's EastEnders to her friends and telling the story with such passion. It was a great story, by the way. It was a great, great story. It was very passionate, you know, the mum, you know, there's people screaming at each other and it's all too late to say sorry because the thing that you knew was going to happen has happened and he's cradling her body in his arms and she hasn't said that she loves him and he's screaming, what about me, mum? Why don't you love... And the woman was acting this out and it was rush hour on Ho Street in Walthamstow. Rush hour. There's all the school kids coming out of McDonald's, there's all the buses, there's all the traffic, there's so much going on. It's, and she was standing in the road, acting it out, <laughs> and her friends were agog with their hands to their face. And I thought, this is it. Because for a long time, and when I first got going in soap, like a lot of my friends from Cambridge would go like, why are you doing that? I know, because I love it. But also, I mean, soap is, it, they don't call it that anymore. They call it long running series. But I love the word soap because the, the thing is, it was always derogatory. Oh, it's what women watch. Lean into it. Lean into it. It was all because what I loved was, you know, you've got half an hour. You've got half an hour. Coronation Street, Emmerdale, East Enders, you've got half an hour. And you're in people's rooms, you're in their houses, you're in their living room or their kitchen, and they trust you, they know you, and sometimes they're not listening. Who knows what kind of day they've had? Stress, the train's late, the kids are being bad, now you've got to cook and you've got to do this and you've got to do that, and the TV is on in the background. And my job is for them to go, wait a minute, what did she just say? <laughs> and for that half an hour, Nothing else matters. You give me your attention and I will give you half an hour, which is got jokes, got passion, got emotion, and it's going to get you going. <coughs> That's what it is. It's theatre for the people who haven't got the money or the time to be able to go to theatre, who haven't got the money or time to go and see a, a, a massive cinema, a massive film. The, going to the theatre on the regular is expensive and it's, it's time consuming and sometimes you've got to get the kids on the food on the table and you've got to get this and you've got to get that. You've got half an hour. That's my half an hour and I'm going to make it every minute of it worth your time. 
even if it might be a little bit ludicrous. As a friend of mine used to say, we are EastEnders. The barely plausible is our stock in trade. <laughs> <laughs> But even then, even then, even if it's like, oh, come on, even then, it's got to be gripping. And we know how it lands. That when, you know, when these shows sing, nothing else touches them. Nothing else. Sometimes you can just get, you, they can be in mind and absolute nonsense for 18 months at a time, and I can be beating my head against the wall thinking, come on, and then you get a story. And, pe and then you remember the power of them. How people respond to the, Characters they've been watching for 30 years of their life, characters they've watched grow up, marked every step of the way, they know where they've come from, and now they're going to do this, oh boy. And, it's, and that, I love it because of that. I've got half an hour with you, and nothing else is going to matter. That's my job, to make you go, yeah, 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 and to make you act it out to your friends because it was that good and it was transformatively good, and you're so full of the story, you've got to tell people. And that's why I love doing it. I, pa I passionately love doing it. As far as I'm concerned, you look at those great soap matriarchs, towering beehives and spitting into their block mascara and <coughs> strapping the fag on and going out to face all comers with their history of terrible men and even worse children, and oh my goodness gracious me. You think, got to think of them like, you know, Margaret d'Anjou and Eleanor of Aquitaine, <laughs> marching through this out there, thigh high in the, with the blood of their enemies, but they're wearing hair extensions. <laughs> or it's like, you know, the Oresteia, it's like the, the, the Furies, but they've got nails. You know, and it, you've got to think of it in a really grand epic way. But yeah, I absolutely... Passionately love doing it. I love doing it. Anyway, and, sorry. And then when you moved on to quality drama, you know. <laughs> no, I was going to say, as I'll people. I'll have you know. As people I'll have call you know, it, I, am, I am the winner of a gold, of, of a great, an award called the Golden Moment. And it was, came from um, an episode I wrote where just a two-hander, which was Den and Dot, in the laundrette, having a go at each other, which was, um, you know, I think had a line in it which was like, Dot saying to Den, if you don't sort this out, I'm going to come back and haunt you. And he said, oh, that's all I need. You sitting at the end of my bed in your wincy at nighty, rattling your chains like Marley's bleeding ghost. I just... <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but, yeah, I, a golden moment, if you can believe there is an award called that. <laughs> anyway, sorry, well, yes, I, quality I, TV. I, I use that term as others use it. I myself no, no, agree with you. I know, I'm teasing and, you, Dorothy. And um, I, I think, you know, you then went on and did Great Expectations, Oliver for Twist example. Uh, uh, Oliver Twist before that. Oliver Twist was... I think I got Oliver Twist because um, the other writer they'd hired... <laughs> hadn't worked out and they needed someone to write it really, really quickly. I don't think they thought, I know what would be good. Let's get Sarah Phelps to do Oliver Twist. I think it was an absolute, um, in technical term in TV, we call it a kick bollock scramble, um, which is just, you know, where, where everybody's smiling, but their eyes are desperate. And, and I, so I, I did, yeah, I did, an, I did an Oliver Twist. We had um, Tim Spall in it, Edward Fox, Tom Hardy playing Bill Sykes. Sophie Okonedo playing Nancy. It was Sarah Lancashire. It was fab. I loved it. And the friend, and a way too friendly bull terrier playing Bullseye. We could never film his back end because he had to look fierce, but his tail was always wagging. <laughs> <laughs> but in those works as well, you created really strong characters. And, and one of the characters I find very interesting um, is the way that you treated Miss Havisham because Miss Havisham is always treated as a pathetic, well, she's negative as a, she's person. As a, she's treated but as a grotesque. how do you see her? Well, I always felt that she was treated as a grotesque. And I can remember when we were doing this and when I, the way I was thinking about her is, <coughs> is that in, in, it says on no page in Great Expectations how old she is. And yet she's always been written really, really old. And I kept thinking, if she is going to do this amount of damage to Pip and to Estella, and she, her power can't be grotesque, her power has to be more sinuous 
and manipulative and more broken and damaged. And because if she's just a grotesque, when you get up close to a grotesque, you can see the cracks in the paint and they stop being frightening. They only work at a distance, like a kind of blank face mask. When you go up close, you go, oh, that's a black, blank face mask. They only work at a distance where the shadows tell you, a, you know, give you an idea about what they might be thinking. And I also thought that what I wanted Miss Havisham to do was I wanted her to almost speak like a child. So, but to have that really layered Mandarin quality to it. So especially for Pip, he thinks it's really important that Pip thinks he's being told something, that he absolutely believes it, otherwise he just looks like a fool. And so I wanted Estella and Miss Havisham's language to be really layered and complex and for Pip to just not have access to that closed language that they shared. So that when he believed that she was giving him this opportunity, you could understand how he believed it because she'd insinuated it. Because otherwise I didn't want Pip to look like an idiot. And there's another issue I have with great expectations is that Joe Gargery comes across like an idiot. I mean, it's just, you know, but why would he be? He's a blacksmith, he has an apprentice, that means he's a part of a guild, he's a businessman. The whole world turns on his anvil. Why is he cast as this bloke who's either bursting into tears or saying what larks, Pip? Anyway, I, so I, I wanted to do some work on him. But for Miss Harrisham, I wanted it to almost be that thing where she was still raw, utterly raw from the betrayal, and that she had become theatrically addicted to it and I wrote a thing which, we, which would never have gone in but sometimes I sort of write scenes that are never going to be filmed just so I know where things are coming from because we forget as well that Estella is an, as a stolen child she's stolen she's Magwitch's daughter she's stolen and I had this Im image in my head and I wrote it down as a way of just sort of so I could understand the, the dynamics of what went on in that house of jaggers bowling through the night in coach and four and gripped, gripping to this bundle that was struggling and just gripping it like that. And it splashes through puddles through this tumultuous dark sky and it goes up to Satis house and it screeches up and pulls up and jaggers gets out with this bundle and fighting this bundle through the corridors, know, all the hallways, up the stairs and down the stairs. And then finally, we see this ethereal figure and it's this woman and she is, it's only just happened. It's only just happened. There's no mold on the wedding cake. It's still fresh. And Jaggers pulls the blanket off this girl and it's this beautiful child, filthy, snarled hair, just absolutely grimy and Miss Havisham in her beautiful wedding dress, takes a child's face, turns it this way and that, and says, you'll do. And I knew that would never go in, but I needed it so I could understand what she wanted and that how raw it was, how immediate it was. I want a child. So that once she hadn't had time to think about it, so that there would be some small hope of a redemption for her. Because otherwise, if she'd been... 20 years thinking about this guy who chucked her, living with a load of rotting scotch eggs, and then got Estella, then you've kind of, I feel like there's a distance from the moment, from the thing which rent your heart and made you crazy. And so that when she sort of burns, your heart breaks for her. Otherwise, it's just a burning, grotesque woman, and there's nothing that to say of what the damage has been done to Pip and Estella. Um, I was going to say something else, but I've forgotten what it is. Oh. Well, I felt that you created in Miss Havisham a strong yeah. person, not the I didn't weak think, and pathetic I, I don't think I person. Wanted, I don't think I wanted her to be strong. I think I wanted her to be the really will in her. complicated. Oh, I know what I wanted to tell you. I wanted to tell you about a bit of stage to, uh, um, set design, which was really, really magic. Um, we had an amazing production designer and who'd taken such, such care with Satis House. And in Miss Havisham's dressing room, we, which you see in pretty much just one scene where, where, it's, where it's a day of her rejection and she can't, she's just broken and she can't talk to anybody. But it's barely seen and there was a beautiful, beautiful sort of tall chinoiserie, um, like a little chest of drawers for jewellery, 
with little drawers that you pulled out. And I was right by the, the, um, the mirror. And I was sort of looking at it and looking, and I realised that there was just something hanging over the edge of the top, top drawer, this beautiful, beautiful thing. And I looked, and it was a strand of, of pearls, but the sort of pearls that loving parents would give to a girl, perhaps on her 13th birthday, like a, that kind of gift. And this had been placed there by the set designer. The camera was never going to pick it up, but it was as if... She had put her hand out to pick up the pearls that her parents had given her so they could be with her as she walked up the aisle. And just as she picked them up, the letter arrived and she dropped them back in. And it was never going to be seen by the camera. I don't even know if Gillian was aware that it was there. But when I'd seen it, it twisted my heart because it was that work that goes on behind, you know, behind the scenes in TV which just changes everything because you know that somebody has read the character that you've written and that they've understood something really fundamental about her and they've just done that tiny thing. And they haven't asked for praise, but it's just a little piece of magic. I thought it was beautiful. Now, in a minute, I'm going to ask the audience for some of their questions, but um, I have to first ask you about two particulars. First of all, Agatha Christie. Yeah. Now, you have reinvented Agatha Christie and you're obviously a great admirer of Agatha Christie um, when I say reinvented well I think you've taken some of her stories I mean if I can quote Lucy Mangan again um, when she watched The Pale Horse oh, yeah. Sarah Phelps has been at the Agatha Christie again <laughs> and I can't help but point out that Mark Easterbrook in the Agatha Christie version is the narrator and heroic and gets the girl at the end, but you turned, yes, I him, turned, I turned, you turned him into a misogynistic because it really killer. Well, the inner well, the book is really confused and strange, and so I made some decisions about that. But one of the things that I really informed me about Mark Easterbrook is that when his girlfriend is recovering from the poison that they've, they've set her up to be poisoned so that they could track down the killer, she's recovering from the poison, she's really ill, but Mark and his friends go out to dinner. So I thought, okay, that's so my cue. So it does turn them into a killer. And it would, but also I'd done a lot of research, I'd done a lot of reading about um, the fascination with witchcraft and the occult in the 1960s. And I'd also, to be, to be fair to Agatha, I'd kind of taken on a bit more of what she was trying to achieve with her books in the 60s, which she was aware that, you know, the, the genre was kind of changing. And you had Patricia Highsmith and people like that, and much more amoral characters. And I think she was really struggling with kind of how to write. She wanted to write an amoral character. And you do get that in, in, in um, Endless Night. But I just thought, I'm going to borrow some of that and just help this book make a bit more sense and give it some real sinew and some drive and some punch. And to kind of rest, because it, it keeps veering into something which feels dangerous and, and electric and alive. And then she pulls it back. And she did do that, in my view, a lot with her later novels. There's a very, she's a very cloaked, veiled writer, especially sort of into the 40s becomes more cloaked and veiled. And there's always little flashes of, I think, the book she wants to write as opposed to the book she knows her readers want to read. And it feels like a real battle and it felt like a real conflict in Pale Horse. So I kind of, I kind of succumbed to the book that I thought she would, was trying to write underneath the book that she thought people wanted to read, which was about poison and was about hair and was about being f terrified of dying. And I felt that that was a really interesting thing to write about in the 60s when everything else is burgeoning. That fear of death, that terror of death. Blimey, it's hot in here, isn't it? Have I been using up all the oxygen? <laughs> <laughs> so do you think she's a more interesting uh, writer than people think? A lot of people I think, dismissed her. I think people dismiss her because she is prolific. And I think that she... She, she really churns them out. I mean, like, my, my God, you, it, I mean, it's extraordinary, her output. So there's a sort of sense of, like, oh, it's another one, it's another one, it's another one. 
But I think that when you go back and when you look at them, and I think because I would, I'd really dismissed a previous and gone, I'm just not interested in doing Agatha Christie because I hadn't read one, it would, you know, before I read and then there were none, um, was asked to read it. I hadn't read any and I just thought I knew what she was. You know, cosy Sunday night, someone's dead on the floor, no one really cares, lacrosse, um, I have gathered you here, mes enfants, to tell you that, and everybody sits there, no one goes, I'm out of here because you've nailed me. They just wait for the police to arrive, it's so dumb. So, um, so I, and I, I, I wasn't into it at all, and then when I read and then there were none, I was blown away by, I was shocked by how remorseless it is, by, you know, there's no, there's no mercy. It is pitiless. And I thought it was subversive. And I thought it had a gallows humour. I thought it was really shocking. And I thought that she had quite a sly... I thought she was being sly. She was saying, here's this nice little ludic parlour game, you know, entertain yourselves with trying to work it out. But I thought that it was an extraordinary thing to write about your... to, to write this particular story in 1939, have it published, you know, she writes very quickly, she's published very quickly, to have it published in the summer of 1939, a mere matter of months before we are about to be plunged into another world war, to say, look at your countrymen, look at your neighbours, look at the doctor, the judge, the butler, the playboy, the secretary. They're murderers. And they just live their lives. There's no mark of Cain upon their brow. They haven't been changed in any way. If they weren't here now, they just carry on living their lives with this curse upon them. I thought that was a startling thing to say in 1939. You can't trust any... You think you know them because they look like you and talk like you. You have no idea what seeds behind the English mask. This is what the judge does in the dark when he thinks he can get away with it. That's what she's saying. And you were, I was talking to um, somebody about the murder of Roger Ackroyd. And, and, I, I, what's the, oh, and I said, the whole point about the murder of Roger Ackroyd, it's a, it's, a, it's a very long suicide note. Can you imagine anything more shocking? And it's a doctor. She was a dispensing chemist for the entirety of World War I, where she was a fad. She, I imagine her looking at the, in, looking at humanity and the experience of human beings coming out of the sort of bullish 19th century, suddenly realising what industrial warfare does to the human brain and the human body and seeing it through the prism of, a gr of the grain of difference that means a man dies or a man lives because that's what you're measuring that medicine out in, you're measuring it in grains. And that it's, everything is balanced upon a pinhead with her, everything. This is the moment you strayed from the path and now this is where you end up. So I always wanted to honour that. And some of her earlier short stories are profoundly shocking about shell shock, about the cruelty and duplicity, about family dynamics. And I think as she goes through her life and becomes more and more successful, she's almost a victim of her own success because I think she's a, a dangerous, raw writer in her earlier years. <clears throat> and then she has to rein it in. But I always think there's clues. There's little alarm bells. There's little atonal moments where you go, what is that doing there? That doesn't fit. And I think they're the clues where you go, there's, some, there's another book in here. There's another book. There's a, a palimpsest of what she wants you to know. And that's what I always did. I tried to follow that. Now, you mentioned there someone straying from the path, and one of my favourite characters that you have created, the Duchess oh. of Argyle. So, um, in a, a very British scandal, yeah. the story of the Duchess of Argyle, um, uh, for anybody who might not know it, who notoriously... Um, was involved in a divorce case in which um, the uh, 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 a depraved photograph, according was, to the, the judge, the was shown. The evidence was, and the evidence had been gathered by her husband breaking into her house and stealing her personal items, D and, um, but he was allowed to do it because he was her husband. And, um, and the Duke. Yeah, the Duke. And the evidence was, oh, there was a lot of love letters, 
but the evidence was Polaroids, which showed Margaret wearing her pearls, <laughs> performing um, fellatio on an unidentified man. And she so Margaret, you know, and basically this formed the basis, and it was extremely scandalous. And here's the thing, you remember I said I used to work in telesales? Well, in 1993, I was prepping, for, I was, we used to have to rip through all the, uh, the papers and the magazines to sort of have, find things to help our pitch. And I was sitting with a guy who, I was obviously terrible at this job, and I was sitting with a guy who kept my spirits up, and we were leafing through it, and he suddenly said, oh my God, she's dead. And I said, oh God, who's dead? Can I swear? Yes. Yeah. And he said, Dirty Margaret, the blowjob duchess. I went, <laughs> who? <laughs> and he said, oh, God. oh, he was very posh. He said, oh, come on, Sarah, for God's sake. Even you must have heard of, you must have heard of her. And I hadn't. And I was looking at the obituary, these two photos of her. One is a very young woman, the most beautiful, stylish, the most photographed, the most wealthy, the most talked about, the most successful woman about town, everybody wanted to get married to her, bloody, bloody, blah, blah, and then her at the very end of her life, when she died penniless in a Pimlico nursing home, having, you know, lost everything, with this huge black wig, like a sort of, sort of weighing down her neck, but still the pearls around her neck. Mm -hmm. And the obituary was all still about who the man was. And I thought, I don't care about the man. Who are you? Because Ian had that. He was going, he could have ruined her. And she still went to court because she wouldn't back down and she wouldn't shut up. And I wanted to write this story because her life was complex and terrible and brutal and extraordinary things happened to her. Was she a nightmare? Probably. Who cares? But she was driven, and she, I thought that she had real courage because Ian was a terrible man. Part of that is to do with um, his experiences in the Second World War, partly because it's, he's a terrible man. He was married to two other women before that, very wealthy. He treated them with a very specifically sadistic, horrible way, and he moved on to the next woman who he seduced, and she gave him all her money, and he ran out of her money, so he moved on to the next one, and he moved on to Margaret, but Margaret fought back. She fought him back, and her weapons were meagre, but my God, she used them. And she was ruined. Uh, the judge, incidentally, in that divorce case, was um, a kind of, you know, a clan relation of Ian, the Duke of Argyles. He was, he was a clan relation through his mother, but nobody seemed to mind that, that but, you know, whether that was made him less than partial. Um, and he... He gave a three, it was, a, you know, the divorce was a closed court, but when he gives the judgment, the press were allowed in because it was a really, really talked about divorce case. He could have said that he'd found in favour of the Duke, these are the damages, but he, his summing up was over three hours long and he made it very clear to all the journalists who were in that court what those Polaroids depicted. And he talked about Margaret's promiscuity, how disgusting she was, how she was unnatural, how she was like a, basically had dragged womanhood through the gutter, and her life was ruined. And I think that, but still, even after that, chin up, lipstick on, makeup on, hair impeccable. She still went out, she still made trouble, she still wound people up, she still fought back, right until the very end. And I love her for that, and I was really determined to tell her story and to give her some really good lines and to have her chasing her husband through the house with an axe because even if she, there was a sort of rumour that she'd done it, but even if she didn't get to do it in real life, she should have been able to do it in her imagination as he cowered behind a door screaming, no, please, I'm sorry. Even for just a moment, she got him to cower, even if it was just an act of imagination. But I've been passionate about that story for a long time because about what it says about what the media likes to do to women, what the world likes to do to women who put their head above the parapet, what her class did to her, because she was... I wrote a theme when a friend of her says, you've got to stop this, because, you know, like, you're dragging us down to the level of all... to the, to the level of the sort of... the bloody greengrocer. You know, that we look like them, all bare asses and flapping cocks, and she goes, you can't do this anymore. And I had to have... I had a, a line got caught, but I was really sad it got, got cut 
because I had, you know, this woman saying, you're going to drag us down to their level and it's hard enough getting staff as it is. And Margaret says, well, maybe we should be dragged down. And this other woman says, you maniac, that's socialism. And I was, like, I was so happy with that line, but they made me cut it. But it was, but what her class and how her class took inside how everyone, and how everyone lied. The people she said Ian was having an affair with and they denied it. After the court case, they admitted it. Mm. The people who'd said that he, you know, he wasn't skimming money from her, after the court case, they all admitted it. And I just thought, I'm going to tell her story. I want, I want, and I want her to flounce away from that courtroom with her head held high and her lipstick on and her little poodle on a lead and the veil over her eyes and to walk over her own headlines. I, I was fascinated with her for a very, very long time. Well, it's absolutely, for anybody who hasn't seen it, it's wonderful. Now, may I invite you, if you have any questions, to... It doesn't matter if you don't, honestly. You might be scared of the 40-minute answer. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Does that work? Yes. Um, I'm a primary school teacher, and I lead writing at our school. And I wondered if you have a tip for would-be writers who, right now, are aged anything from between four and 11. <laughs> listen to everything, listen hard, look hard, find things funny, and don't be afraid to cry. And love words and love words and they'll love you back. That's great <laughs> advice. Gosh. Thank you very and I mean, much. Like, imagine that your kids be going, oh. <laughs> uh, No, I think that would be, they'd, they'd be very receptive. Thank you oh, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, down to the front. Hi, so you said something um, early on about um, keeping the research material for the Sixth Commandment in a chest, yeah. locked away. Yeah. And I was just wondering, you write such dark material a lot of the time, you know, a lot of it's dealing with very harrowing topics. Do you have strategies to kind of box that content away to stop yourself? I think if it it's, I think when it's fictional, it's different. This was very different because it was, had ha it had happened to real people and to a real community and people were, st were still feeling it. The trial um, for the Sixth Commandment, Ben Phil's trial, was very recent. It was 2019, Brian. So the, it, has a, it has a kind of malign pulse. And there's a lot of stuff in there which, you know, genuinely gave me nightmares, which were, I had recurrently when we were about to um, go into transmission, when it was about to go out on the BBC. So that was fun. And I just think, because I have to keep all that research material in case there's any questions um, or anything comes up legally. I have to be able to refer to all my notes. But I keep it locked up and bolted away. And I just think it works. I have to have it in my study because I might need it. But it really helps to just go, you're in there now. Stay there. Shh. That's not Peter and Anne. It's him. You're in there. Stay there. Shut up. We've heard enough. We've heard enough from you now. Get in there. So it helps just to be able to turn a key. Yeah, interesting. Yes, here. Hello. Hello. Um, when you're writing uh, fiction based on fact um, or on real people's lives, there is the truth and then there's the emotional truth. And sometimes, you know, as, as the writer, you have to make things up for fiction but they are based on, on as you know, the, the scene you described with the axe didn't really yeah. happen, but you made it because it felt like emotional truth to you. How do you draw, how do you draw the line? Where do you draw the line? What, um, is, what passes and what doesn't pass? Well, interestingly enough, the, there were, in one of the books I had for the research for The Duchess of Argyle, there was a whole sequence where um, Ian had locked himself into his study and called the police because he was so scared of Margaret. Unfortunately, in that same book, there was the writer had used some hearsay, which meant for the purposes of legal compliance, we could not therefore write the book, use the book as a, as a 
as a source because legal compliance is, is extremely exacting. Um, so that's why I made it an imaginative thing because then that means that I can go, even though, you know, I can say that it happened, but it happened in here, so it wasn't so much physically. When, when do you, where do you draw the line? Well, for example, with this story, with the Sixth Commandment, the legal compliance was extremely stringent. We had to be really, really careful. Brian and myself, when we were working through it, I'd have to keep notes. I, I mean, I pretty much knew it all, in, had it all committed to memory just so I could write it. But so as we went through, we had to have a sort of spreadsheet for each scene, where does this come from? Does this come from um, interviews with families? In, uh, does it come from the police investigation? Does it come from Peter's diaries? Does it come from Ben's own workbooks? Does it come from the court, uh, from the trial? Does it come from a newspaper? And then you have to basically do, here's your primary, secondary and tertiary sources. Honestly, it's, it's, it's really that involved. So there was always that sort of sense that even when you're finding a path through the thing that happened as evidenced by trial transcript by police investigation, by Peter's own diaries, by the memories and observations of the victim's families, by um, the articles written in papers, you've got to be able to sort of like go, this is the source, this is how I've imagined it, so I can en encompass it and move it forward to the next thing. But it was incredibly stringent. And you have to always have a mind about this for editorial policy and for legal compliance that what you're doing is not gratuitous, that you have so many different checks and balances to make sure that you're, uh, you're protecting everybody from reputational damage, you're not doing anything that could be seen as being defamation and that or misrepresentation. Even right down to the fact that in the edit, you'd be watching the expressions of the actors playing real people in case they smiled at an inopportune moment, which the real person can then say, that indicates that I was feeling like this. So, you, it, I mean, it's, I can't tell you how complex it is to sort of stand something like that up, but you have to make sure that you've got a solid basis of being able to cite your sources so that you can say, and I've amalgamated all these sources into this scene. Does that make sense? So you can get the emotional truth with a solid bedrock of absolutely exhaustively examined evidence. Sorry, can I just ask, you know, I, I watched The Crown and there were so many scenes in it which happened between two people. Um, how does the writer write those? How, oh, how The Crown? This, well, they nobody see, was there. But the, the thing is, The Crown's Netflix. Netflix doesn't give a damn about legal compliance or editorial <laughs> policy. You want to bring a vexatious complaint against Netflix? I don't care if you are, you know, the royal family. Do your worst. But so, you know, they may, I mean, a lot of that is made up, but it, that's accepted. And they have a different kind of, um, they do have a different kind of remit to the BBC because it's a much more faceless organisation. It's financed in a different way. And the BBC is public service. It's financed by the public. It serves the public. We have a much more different remit and a totally different, you know, the BBC has a totally different set of ethics and morals which they have to adhere to. They just have to. Netflix can do what they want. There was a scene um, sometimes when you watch between, there was a scene where it was really, really sweary. It was hilarious. It was a very good scene. But I thought, my God, how did they get away with that? I can't get away with that. I can't get away with that without have, having some legal team calling me at four o'clock in the afternoon and saying, going to have to change everything. So it's just, it's a totally different model as to how they work and how we worked with this. Thank you. And, yes? With, with the Sixth Commandment, what was the relationship between the timing of your screenplay and the casting? Did you know what the cast was going to be when you were writing, or did, did, did you have to adapt it when you...? No. We, we started... Um, so... Uh, Obviously, we sort of started working on this when we were sort of in, still in and out of the pandemic. And um, I'd written pretty much the first two episodes when we sort of started talking to a director, our director Saul Dib. And it was at that sort of point where we were sort of saying, because when the director comes on board, everybody starts to get really excited about the cast. So, um, so Saul had said, well, you know, who do you imagine playing Peter? And Saul had said immediately, 
Timothy Spall. And everyone went, oh, my God, like this. So, I mean, so it wasn't adapted or anything. We, Tim had a long conversation. We emailed back and forth. Tim had lots of conversations with um, Saul. And it's really, you know, it was amazing, really. I didn't change anything. Tim just brought his just brought his magic to it. I just think it, and it's a standout performance. And when we were in the read-through, he made me cry. And I never cry in read-throughs because I'm always so worried about the notes that are going to come or all the things that can go wrong in a production and, you know, have to change this and do that. But Tim's, even, even in read-through, when everybody's sitting down in a big, cold, drafty room and you can barely hear anybody, Tim made me cry. He was, and I think it's an extraordinary, it, it's almost like it's not a performance, it's almost like he inhabits it. It's incredibly vulnerable. It was so, it was so, and he, and I had an email exchange with him where I said, oh, come on, you must, and he said, it scares me. That means I must, doesn't it, if it scares me? And he was just was leaned into that vulnerability and embodied it, just like, uh, uh, he sort of, as if it's breathing. You don't even see the performance. It just looks like that vulnerability just there. Completely raw, completely broken, completely naked. I think it's a wonderful, wonderful performance of his. Well, it's an extraordinary performance because the writing was written by an extraordinary woman. And you have talked about all the courageous women who you have portrayed, but you are a courageous woman. You are a courageous writer. If only Agatha Christie had met you, you could have told her. I think and she'd maybe have you should, hated me. You, you, you should write this when you meet Agatha Christie and say, come on, Aggie, you can do it. You, you can, can do it. You can do it. You I would can like to, do it. I would do like it. to write about the time she disappeared. That's what I'd like to write about. I can't wait. And... Um, we're so, your mother must be so proud of you, <laughs> and I just have to say that as a mother, <laughs> and, and we are so proud that you are one of us, and thank you so much, and you can have a drink now, and I'm sorry it was so bright and hot. Thank you. Thank you.